Hi, uh, good evening, everyone, or good morning, or good afternoon, whichever part of the world uh, you're in. A very, very, very warm welcome to you um, at the eighth edition of the Urban Lens Film Festival. Uh, usually, the festival takes place in the city of Bangalore um, in South India and uh, New Delhi. Uh, but due to the ongoing uh, COVID-19 pandemic, this is the second year we've had to have the festival online. Um, but what this has allowed us to do, it, uh, it means we have viewers joining us from different parts of the world uh, to be part of the viewings and panel discussions um, that happen. So um, really lovely to have all of you here who've joined us this evening. Uh, today, we're actually going to have a book discussion on Bombay Hustle making movies in a colonial city. Uh, this is actually the first time uh, we have a book discussion as part of the Urban Lens Film Festival. I mean, usually we have film screenings and we talk to the filmmakers about uh, their films that we screen and also filmmakers in general, uh, whether they're directors, filmmakers, um, I mean, directors, cinematographers or editors about their practice. Um, because one of the main uh, features of Urban Lens is to not just screen uh, films, but to actually talk about what this idea of film practice in itself is. And and we've over the years uh, got practitioners to reflect upon their work. Uh, but starting this year, we felt like it may be interesting to also not just get filmmakers to speak about their work, but also people who write around it, um, academics or film critics. Um, so starting it is this year, uh, we're starting it with Bombay Hustle, making movies in a colonial city. And it's an absolute pleasure to have Debushri Mukherjee, who's the author of the book. And even more interesting because actually Debushri started um, her career as a film practitioner. And um, then, of course, she went on. She's now a film academic and Devashri Mukherjee will be in conversation with uh, Rohan Shivkumar. So before I hand it over to Rohan, I'm going to um, introduce Devashri and Rohan. I'm, I'm sure many of you who've joined us already know them, are familiar with their work and I hope many of you have read the book uh, and if not read the book at least uh, I'm sure you've had, you would have had a chance to encounter Devashri's writing. But nevertheless I'm going to introduce Devashri Mukherjee is Associate Professor in the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies, MISAS at Columbia University. Her new book, Bombay Hustle, Making Movies in a Colonial City, uh, which was published last year in 2020, approaches film history as an ecology of material practices and practitioners and has been shortlisted for the Modernist Studies Association and Richard Wall Memorial Book Prizes. Devashree's latest peer-reviewed essay, Somewhere Between Human, Non-Human and Woman, Shanta Apte's Theory of Exhaustion, received the 2001 Catherine Singer Kovacs Award from the Society of Cinema and Media Studies. Uh, she's currently editor-in-chief of the peer-reviewed journal Bioscope, South Asian Screen Studies, and is editing two new anthologies on the photographic archive of German cinematographer Joseph Wirsching and Asian cinemas. She's also co-editing a, spe a special issue of feminist media histories with Dr. Pavitra Sundar, titled Decolonial Feminisms in Media's Res. Debushree's next book project develops a transmedial history of indentured labor and South-South migrations. Very warm welcome to you, Debushree, and especially appreciate it because it's really early morning where you're based. So we really, truly appreciate that you've been able to uh, join us really early morning today. She will be in conversation with uh, Rohan Shivkumar. For those of you who've been attending Urban Lens over the years, I'm sure are familiar with Rohan's work and his film work. And uh, as I often say, he's a comrade of the festival. So welcome, Rohan. Rohan is an architect, urban designer, and filmmaker practicing in Mumbai. He's the dean of the architecture course at the Kamla Raheja Vidyanidhi Institute for Architecture and Environmental Studies. He's also a principal of the Architectural Urban Practice Collaborative Design Studio and is a member of CRIT, an urban research collective based in Mumbai. His work ranges from architecture, urban research and consultancy projects to works in film and visual art. He's interested in issues concerning housing, public spaces and in exploring the many ways of reading and representing the city. As an academic, he lectures regularly on issues concerning architectural pedagogy and the city of Mumbai. He's been involved in developing academic curricula at the Kriva and teaches design studio and theory courses. He also heads the research and design cell in the school and has helped sh uh, in shaping many of its projects. Uh, these included projects in Dharavi, the fishing villages of the city, and a research project examining the relationship of cinema with the city of Mumbai, the project, the project uh, which is called uh, Cinema City. Uh, 
He is also the co-editor of the publication that emerged from this interdisciplinary research and art collaboration and was deeply involved with the setting up of the public exhibitions. He's also led a research and exhibition project documenting the space of Dr. Ambedkar in the city of Mumbai. Welcome, Rohan. Welcome, Debashri. Um, we're all really happy and excited to have you both at the festival. And I now hand it over to you, Rohan. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Subhashri and IHS for giving me the opportunity to talk about this book. And uh, Debashri, of course, for this incredible kind of piece of um, a piece of work. Uh, it was truly exciting for me to read it uh, because it had so many uh, of the ideas that that concerning the city of Bombay, its history, cinematic pra cinematic practice itself. Um, and as someone who had worked on some of these themes a few years back as part of the Cinema City project that uh, that Subhishri has mentioned, it was really exciting to see so many of these ideas um, within the book. Um, and what I loved about the book was it's, uh, it's, it, it was theoretically exciting and interesting, bringing new ideas to the table. It also had these incredible stories of the city of Mumbai in the 30s and the 40s and looking at the way that the city was really a, a space that provided all these incredible opportunities for so many kinds of people uh, to kind of treat this as a place where they made uh, these incredible moving images. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually, uh, actually um, you know, before we kind of uh, get into the Q&A, uh, maybe Devish, you would like to uh, tell us a little bit about, about the book itself and how it came to be. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, so I just want to first start with um, thanks. Thank you so much to um, Urban Lens. Shubhashri Krishnan for inviting me and to uh, inviting me in the conversation with Rohan Shiv Kumar, whose work I deeply admire. And uh, uh, Majlis's Cinema City books have been very, very uh, inspiring and formative for me in the last decade that I've been trying to uh, work on this book. And also just a quick shout out to everyone behind the scenes at Urban Lens, Yasho, Jamie and Sabri. Thanks for all the the quiet and uh, efficient work that you're doing behind the scenes. What I'm going to do is just do like a short, maybe around 10 minute um, intro to the book. And to do that, I'm going to just open up with um, a slide share. So just give me a second to do that. Okay, so do you see now um, the PowerPoint? And if someone can just tell me whether you're only seeing the PowerPoint or you're seeing something else. No, we're seeing the PowerPoint and we're seeing you speak. So. Okay, great. So I'll just launch into it. So for those uh, of you that are encountering this book for the first time, Bombay Hustle, Making Movies in a Colonial City, narrates a history of Bombay cinema as a history of material practice, production, and work. And it specifically looks at a very formative period in the life of the Bombay film industry, which was the talky transition of the 1930s. I try to show how cinema during this very turbulent time in the life of India extended into every area of urban life. So part of the argument is that the screen is only one part of a dense ecology of things and people that mutually constitute cinema. Cinema exceeds the content on the film screen and embraces a density of embodied cultural techniques that are predicated indeed on a future image, but that take place long before that final film product even reaches the theater. So part of what I'm arguing is that the work of ideating, acting, writing, dancing, stitching, lighting, or even simply waiting on the sets in preparation for a shot are very much equal parts of the history of cinema and should be central to our understanding also of local productions of modernity. As different bodies pushed a camera trolley, or pulled in this case, adjusted the focus on a lens, or mixed pigment powders to match an actress's skin tone, they also crafted fresh imaginations of who the individual was and what they could be. In the process, Cinema alters the city, and a new historical figure comes into being, which is the cine worker. The cine worker's experience of the self as worker is an embodied intuition 
that the modern world is deeply wrapped up with the techno industrial at the same time that the body extends into and folds itself within itself complexities of space time and environment but just to go back a little bit to how i came to this project before i was trained as a film historian and theorist i was trained as a filmmaker from 2004 to 2007 i worked full time in mumbai's film and tv industries as an assistant director for films and even as a camera person for a reality tv show that i will not name today i was freelancing from job to job moving from apartment to apartment and struggling to keep up with rent increases following what angela mcrobbie has so powerfully uh, analyzed in this book the call and the injunction to be creative now during these years i frequently had the intuition that my work and my city were intertwined in some very uncanny ways so for example when i would return home in an auto late at night a street corner that was a wash in yellow tungsten light suddenly started to feel like a film set the sound of rain clattering on the roof of an editing studio would feel like the very definition of bombay and waiting at church gate station for the fast train to burivili i would often catch myself humming film songs that were actually articulating very subconscious emotions in moments like these cinema and the city merged into one and bodily affects started to seamlessly traverse the worlds of film and life so thinking with lived experience is of both myself as a practitioner in the 2000s and of multiple historical protagonists whom i have encountered during a decades worth of research i now think of bombay cinema as a cine ecology where bodies institutions technologies and environments collectively shape the production and the circulation of cinematic meaning cine ecologies emerge out of the energetic entanglement of practices symbols infrastructures ideologies actors and indeed climates that swirl around the film image in locations where film making and film consumption are very prominent aspects of everyday life and so this is a kind of a model that could apply to various um, important sites of film making and consumption across the world but the cine ecology is tied to its own time and its own place even as it is caught up within translocal relations that are both material and affective now the analytic of a cine ecology seeks to offer a very dynamic but also inclusive framework that can accommodate the situatedness of a cinema in its immediate environment as well as talk to the relational nature of cinema and film production what this means for bombay cinema is that filmic creation is a product of multiple relations and forces and that a film industry is shaped by its proximity to other industries like cotton and communications for example and that cinema owes a lot to other film production centers so bombay cinema cannot be seen as siloed and uh, stuck within a particular geographical location but draws on the energies of various other film production centers that were also starting to thrive in the 30s such as calcutta kolhapur pune lahore madras and indeed that cinema itself as a medium draws on many other media forms like the gramophone radio theater and literature so cinema is thus a continually shape shifting medium and bombay cinema far exceeds the perimeters of the map city now since the theme of urban lens this year is labor and the city i just want to end my intro by talking to the title um, of the book in which there is a word hustle the word hustle is very popular today to describe efforts to make it within a very unequal marketplace of labor and commodities and as such it offers me a bridge between the 1930s and today and to name what is a very intensely speculative work of gambling on the future with your body your money your talent and your emotions so hustle helps me think very carefully about the labors of the working body which is also at the same time the desiring self it helps me to move across different scales from the macro to the micro the big picture of industry and little gestures of intimate work 
And I very tried, I very consciously tried to populate the book with a multiplicity of distinct and often even antithetical voices that informed film practice and were in turn informed by the movies. So in the book, you will meet the film fan who eagerly awaits a big break, a junior artist who patiently waits for her turn outside a film studio, the producer entrepreneur who anticipates future profits through a series of calculated risks. Each of these figures is located in quite different temporalities, right? even though they're coeval in a sense. And each is half turned towards the future. This orientation of the cine worker's body towards the future is part of the temporality that I'm trying to indicate with the term hustle, where hustle is a form of speculative action a gamble on the future, but from a site of very immediate vulnerability. So I'll I'll stop there. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, thanks, Devishri, for that introduction. And I think it uh, really covered some of the most uh, kind of exciting things about the book. Uh, you know, the the ecological metaphor, for example, that really allows you to see uh, the city itself. As an ecology that an ecology that enables certain kinds of cine uh, uh, workers, uh, you know, gives them trajectory of fulfillment in some senses, or enables them or disables them in some senses. And uh, one of the interesting things about the way that you define the cine ecology is that you blur the boundary between the human and the non-human, and the, you know. So I'm just interested that you'd like to elaborate on that a little. Yeah, so one of the things that was uh, interesting to me as I was, so I've been working on this on this kind of history for several years, starting with my MPhil uh, way back in, I think, 2007 in New Delhi. And a lot has changed for me conceptually between then and 2020. And one of the things I started to get more interested in was thinking, uh, as many scholars are thinking today, uh, and practitioners, with this idea of the Anthropocene, with this kind of extinction event that we're going through on a planetary scale, um, to rethink the, the centrality of the human in humanity's work. And a lot of attention that's taking place now um, on shifting that focus to the non-human. So I was very much interested in thinking that question, uh, but also to rem remember that the human, again, can't just be summarily disavowed uh, in our turn to the non-human. So I'm very much interested in the question of, say, human labor. And part of what I'm trying to argue here is that we should be able to think of cinema as a collaborative form of creation, production, that takes place through the relations between multiple forces in a place and time, including human bodies that are differentiated along various social parameters but also including things like technology, equipment, the, the heat of, of that moment in that particular month, the monsoon, um, also ideology, the, the politics of this late colonial period and so on. So it was very important for me to be able to think of cinema as this kind of multi-pronged, a relational and collaborative form, right? an ecological form that is not produced by the genius of one solitary individual's mind, right? But that comes together in a shape by multiple forces. Uh, and you know, that brings me actually to just discussing the overall structure of the book. Uh, because the way that you seem to kind of structure the book is along uh, two sorts of uh, parts. Uh, the first part being called elasticity and the second yeah. part being called energy. Uh, how did you arrive upon that as the the structure through which we get these incredible stories? So part of the um, structural dilemma that I had was that, of course, when you're trying to talk about a, a, a kind of a historical moment and a particular subject that you feel hasn't been adequately discussed, you want to tell every part of the story that you can think of. Right? So I had done a lot of archival work over the years, archival work, uh, some kind of archival ethnography, 
try to embark on individual oral history work, trying to seek out families of practitioners. If you're working on the 1930s, you're not going to find people from that time period to speak to. But you speak to their descendants, try to see if they have any materials, memories, photographs from the period. So I knew that part of what I wanted to do was first tell us a kind of industrial story of practice and different technical, financial, and other practices um, that led to the consolidation and emergence of this hugely powerful film industry and cultural form, right, uh, which is Bombay cinema. But at the same time, also to kind of zoom in and look at individual practitioners um, by situating them within relational kinds of networks. So the first part of the book, which is called Elasticity, um, focuses on the many kinds of discursive, technical, and infrastructural maneuvers that uh, film industry uh, practitioners, often above the line workers, so executives, producers, directors, actresses, were engaged in to first of all try to establish that this was a respectable industry and that it could even be seen as a national and Swadeshi industry. So this is a late colonial moment, right? And this is the years of a final push towards, um, uh, towards independence. So there is a lot of interest in this moment of thinking about indigenous industry. What is Swadeshi industry? And a lot of film industry folks wanted to position film which was a very dubious cultural form at that time, very taboo, considered very transgressive, considered a place of promiscuous men and women, um, a place of perhaps contagion, right? You could get contaminated by the cinema. So a move to kind of resituate them as respectable, modern, scientific, and Swadeshi. So the first part deals with that. And the second part then goes into the uh, question of how to think about this, this kind of meta view uh, but through stories of intimacy. And by intimacy, I mean that I move here more to the body of the laboring worker, uh, widely understood from a star actress to a stunt worker. And how those two stories, those two views, right, the kind of macro and the more intimate, are both equally essential to understand cinema as something in this time that is also lived uh, as a lived form. Yeah, I mean, what you know, um, the first part really covers some really, you know, really interesting kinds of questions. I think that really uh, touch upon, um, you know, the way that actually Bombay and its various sorts of uh, industries uh, very often had kinds of common networks and relationships uh, that you really bring out in the way, for example, you really talk about um, the three studios that you describe, you know, um, and and the way in which they actually begin to produce films, where does the money come from? I love those stories. Uh, maybe that's something that you could kind of talk about. Thank you. I, I always uh, I'm conflicted about which part of the book is more interesting <laughs> to people. It's like, oh, everything, the first half of the film is good and then don't bother going back after the interval, right? Or everything comes together in the second half. Um, no, so it was very important for me to also tell those nitty gritty stories about um, what were the conditions of possibility, right? That enabled this hugely culturally, uh, historically um, significant film form and industry. So I was very interested in also uh, speaking back to some assumptions that we have both in, in, in popular discussion and in academia about the backwardness of Indian cinema in this time. So I wanted to actually go to the actual practices, organizational structures, where was finance coming from? Was there a script or was there not a script? Right? These are just kind of urban legends. Oh, in Bombay, nobody works with a script. It all started after Dil Chata Hai. Karan Akhtar brought a Hollywood sensibility, right? So these, these I wanted to see, uh, is this true, right? Has this been an industry that's always been funded by underworld money, 
chaotic practices mm -hmm. and we are always catching up with hollywood so as i started to dig into those actual concrete questions i realized that that's not true <laughs> and it cannot be true because when a particular film form is trying to consolidate itself there are multiple practices that are taking place right and it's a very messy terrain so one of the things that i'm trying to establish for example in chapter 1 which follows this question of where is the money coming from it uh, leads me to a very interesting story of the relation between bombay city particularly its uh, status as the cotton capital of south asia and films that were made there so part so chapter 1 really does this work of thinking about the relation of cotton and cinema and i do it through the cat concept and the practice of financial speculation so what was interesting is since this was a both a colonially neglected uh, industry the colonial gaze was mainly only interested in censorship of anti colonial images it wasn't interested so much in the where the money was coming from or even providing aid so it was industrially and financially neglected at the same time many local traditional um financial practices speculative practices like futures trading on cotton cotton futures right were being criminalized by the colonial apparatus and being mm -hmm. opposed to supposedly modern uh, forms of speculation like the stock market and so the so film then became a, a venue for a lot of the money uh from the cotton futures market to enter into film finance so i tracked through the three studios um bombay talkies sagar movie tone and ranjit movie tone some of the ways in which this happened so for example ranjit movie tone is started by a, a intrepid young uh, director producer chandulal shah now chandulal shah uh, and ranjit by the way I don't think anyone here would have heard of Ranjit Movie Tone, right? Ranjit Film Company, but it was the Yashraj Studios of the thirties, right? It was producing like six to eight films a year. It had all the biggest stars under uh, on contract, and not even one film from that studio exists for us to watch today. So we have completely forgotten this. So now Chandu Lal Shah uh, was this big film magnate, right? And he was actually making a and one of the things that was curious to me and i'll just another minute and i'll, I'll stop one of no, the no no it's exciting to me was now this is a company that's making six films a year and they're all super hits it was known as ranjit as a galaxy of stars but when you read more about its business history you realize that they were working on very little amounts of actual a liquidity from film to film so they were constantly scrounging for loans from here and there so the question was what's happening with all these profits they're churning out so it turns out that chandulal shah was constantly refunneling money from the stock market and from horse racing right into and out of ranjit film company which meant that sometimes they would be broke and sometimes they would be flush with money and then they would pay dividends and bonuses to their star and tanura was known as the cotton king in a sense uh, of the share market so some of these stories are very direct right where the cotton monies are really actually very crucial to the everyday existence of a studio and in some cases it's 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 less direct but uh, okay. yeah i like the kind of um, the, you know when when you even in your title the idea of the hustle uh, because even a studio like bombay talkies you present the narrative in a way that it's full of these negotiations and a lot of waiting and a lot of kinds of using of contacts and things like that so i found that really interesting because I mean, you tell both of these stories uh, and you tell another of course uh, as completely different ways in which uh, individuals are really uh, kind of i guess leveraging uh, what they can uh, within the city and i wanted to do that with bombay talkies because bombay talkies actually is has is like over represented given the huge amount of lack we have in the film archive the bombay talkies films mostly are extant and available to watch you'll find them on youtube and they def you'll see prints in the national film archive 
and it has a very outsized kind of role in the the story of the history of indian cinema very justifiably but also partly because the films exist and the stories exist and it has a reputation for being the most modern and corporate of all the studios at the time because it was set up by people that were coming in from germany and england and because it had um, it was a public limited company with a board of directors and it was a subscription related uh, situation so i just wanted to slightly unsettle that idea by by noting how much it actually depended on um, social networks and and affects like trust and friendship and goodwill and reputation and shame um so i look at a bunch of letters right that were full of anguish and anxiety in the moments in the years before the studio was even set up uh, to kind of complicate right that everything isn't a black and white story that you start a public subscription and you're going to have a perfectly scientific model of of business yeah and the chance encounter in a train you know these are the exciting kind of uh, moments <laughs> that really make up the make up the uh, book actually uh, uh, the what was interesting for me was of course you know you were talking about the amount of material that you went about looking for and and and, and found um, and thinking about the kinds of materiality uh, the kind of tangible stuff uh, that you read uh, to be able to write the story so i was really interested in this paraphernalia uh, you know and your interest in it actually as the location where all these energies seem to kind of uh, uh, in, i guess they coalesce together in a manifestation of sorts, you know? uh, would you like to talk a little bit about that in terms of what your process was of discovering these um, and your attention to these so if i look at this question as a source archival sources question right then the thing that very quickly became clear to me so i was starting from a place where the overwhelming sense that i had and the narrative was of lack absence right so as i keep saying in every talk and i mention in the book one of the real kind of tragedies or criminal parts of the whole story of the history of indian cinema is that we've lost so many films so the, the time period that i'm looking at by a conservative estimate i can safely say the 95% of the films made in those years we will never be able to watch right so if you're dealing with that kind of an absence then how do you even begin to tell a story about films and their and their making and then i realized that if you just look a little bit adjacent to that missing film object you start to find a huge number in a proliferation of other kinds of sources so it became very interesting to me and very clear that there's a huge amount that can be told about a history of celluloid by looking at paper so paper sources like newspapers song booklets um film posters um became a hugely kind of abundant uh, source for me to uh, talk about this period and then i also take paperwork seriously um even as as an object of study so in chapter 2 where i discuss the continuity script right uh you know in an effort to kind of talk back to this idea that we've never had uh, script practices there was never any organization um i talk about the huge interest there was in the 30s in um in even propagating an idea of how to write a continuity script so film magazines which are giving you gossip about stars and film reviews are also teaching you and there are there are these kind of serialized manuals how to write a continuity screenplay right how to kind of transition from shot to shot how to mention interior exterior day night main characters dissolve to next shot right cut to these things are being taught to the general reading public right um so there's a crazy interest there and i'm also interested in what continuity script um can also be a kind of paper technology so when we're thinking about film as technology we don't only think about the camera and lights as, as technological but the the paperwork itself is technological because of the way in which it produces certain workflows right and the way that it it's part of that entire apparatus so the continuity script 
is for those who know it's a very important tool in pre-production that converts the entire kind of story content of a film into data right and it and that data can then be taken out piecemeal to determine your shooting schedule which costumes on which day and so on and this was very exciting to me because i had done most of my the chunk of the work i had done as an ad in bombay in the 2000s was as a continuity and script supervisor so my daily bread and butter was dealing with continuity camera continuity but also dealing with all this paperwork right which costumes which props which people when to move from day to night so it was amazing for me to actually find that kind of stuff in the 1930s which i had thought it was new and we were all bringing in for the first time in this new bollywood that we were creating and uh, it's fun <laughs> i love uh, the collections of uh, sort of these uh, cuttings from different sources that that are that are within the book the advertisements the the articles they were they were really really interesting uh, a, an important theme i think that runs all the way through the book is in some ways the this, the world of women uh, or the, the the participation of women in making the film industry and i think there is a, a definite attempt that you're making across the book to uh, start in some senses revise some of our presumptions of the history of uh, of of of, in, of uh, bombay based filmmaking i guess um and it kind of comes together also within the within the hunger strike that chanta apte that you kind of describe quite quite a lot in detail in fact you spend the entire chapter discussing that uh, to a large extent so would that be something that we can kind of discuss Yeah as you were talking I was I remembered something that was very important for me and again everything that became important to me right was emerging from the archive as I was looking at this stuff I was realizing that many of my my assumptions presumptions about history of film were actually quite misplaced mistaken and one of the things that came as a shock to me was how absolutely crucial women were to the even possibility of a film industry in bombay right and by that i mean along many many parameters so the 1930s actually is a time where the main kind of um uh, attraction of films is the actress so the actress the actress's body the idea of this modern woman on screen um and it was it's also interesting that unlike the immediate post independence years Like in the 1950s, when we see people like Dilip Kumar, Devanand, Guru Dutt, um, the 1930s and 40s is very much the time of the the actress. So the main star spectacle of the 30s is the actress. The actress is headlining everything. She is the main um, brand ambassador for commodity and advertisements. um she is the first name that shows up um in the credits and on theater marquees and she is getting paid way more than her male counterparts now all of this was very shocking to me because we continue to be in that moment right where we're constantly coming back against this question of pay parity right why should deepika padukone get paid less than akshay kumar if they're both in the same film and the whole the whole picture is completely reversed in the 1930s so i started to think about what was happening with this and how to talk about it in some kind of systematic and rigorous way the other thing that was interesting to me was uh, when we tell stories of urban history urban modernity right gender is is never too far from the story because one of the promises which also becomes the threats of the industrial modern city is the presence of women in public which both becomes part of the excitement right but it also becomes an opportunity for moralizing that who are these women right there's going to be sexual promiscuity with this anonymity in the city and so on so i was very interested in dislodging some of those ways of thinking and try to think a bit more productively with this idea of the urban single working woman as this anonymous figure who could not be fixed looking at a woman in a, a modern sari wearing a modern style of blouse and holding a handbag and getting on the local train to churgate you can't really tell what her vocation is 
right? What her background is and, and a lot. And I was a bit kind of frustrated with the ways in which Bombay histories always end up comparing, going back to the Namdeo Dhasar um, poem about Bombay, my beloved whore, right? And which in many ways redoes that kind of oppositional thing, that Bombay is that seductive thing that entraps you. And I want you to think about how that, that idea of this anonymous working woman who could be a sex worker, could be a film worker, could be a hairdresser, could be a political activist going for a Prabhat Ferry, right? Was actually a co-traveler, right? Not someone on the outside that's seducing and entrapping. But we're all moving together, right? Towards this idea of freedom and modernity. So there's many ways in which the woman question is important to me. I can discuss the Shanta Apte story a bit if you want, but you're muted, Rohan. Ah, sorry. Uh, I think it. Uh, I think we could, and I think it, you might find a way to kind of uh, you know respond to Tripti Patankar's question, which is in the chat here. It says that your book and your public writing in many ways recovers the lost history of actresses in the 20s and 30s. I see it as a feminist project. How easy or difficult was this? How much of what you write about is uh, recovered from the archive and clues that it provides? Could you talk about this? And maybe we can talk about the Shanta Apte uh, story. Uh, yeah. Okay. No, so it's definitely a feminist project, right? Uh, before I, I started working on this book, I, was, I wrote a few articles which were very centrally interested in this question of what is the status and significance of the film actress in the 30s and how to think about it as a kind of labor and work, right? So not interested only in, okay, there's this amazing star and, and these are the films that she did, but what can I tell an industrial embodied and labor story through this, through this figure? Um, so it's not easy because um so the 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 stories of women that one would see most um most legibly and most accessible in the archive are those that are stars but even the biggest stars of that time period gohar mama jiwala devika rani sabita devi sulochna zubeda um there are very few comprehensive biographies of any of these women so that in itself was very, very interesting, right? And in the book, you'll see me tell a little bit about the biographies of many women, but each of those, even those four lines that I've put in many places, I've had to stitch together multiple clues from multiple places to figure out date of birth, place of birth, education, right? First film, um, first film company. So it was very, very hard. The, the biographical stories are very fragmented and dispersed, um, which is very intriguing and which leads to a very kind of age old question for feminist historians, especially feminist film historians, which is why do we not know about these women? Why is their information so scarce? Um, and part of it obviously has to do with certain biases in historiography itself. What do we look at? What are we looking for, right? So you can't tell a story of something you're not looking for. If you're not interested in, in women in the 30s, you will not find those stories. But if you go in with that question, you will start to find multiple places uh, through which those stories can be told. So one thing that was very intriguing to me, and I'll just use that as a, as a case to explicate. Um, so Shanta Apte, many of us have heard of Shanta Apte. She had a long and uh, successful career in film and as a singer, right? Um, and in, in multiple languages and across different cities. So she worked in Lahore, she worked in Bombay, she worked in Pune, uh, in different languages. And we don't know very much about her. But one thing that I found interesting was I came across this incident where she went on a hunger strike in 1939 in protest against her, her company studio, which was Prabhat Film Company. Now Prabhat Film Company has again that huge legendary reputation, just like Bombay talkies and new theaters. And so it was intriguing for me how this big star of the time, why did she go on strike? 
against this very amazing studio prabhat and that led to me led me into many many other kinds of rabbit holes sometimes and i then uh, track try to find um, shanta apte's daughter nena apte and through a series of conversations with her uh, she told me that she had a copy of a book that her mother had written in marathi that she had self published in the year after the strike called zaumi cinema should i join the movies so once i got a hold of that book which has been considered by many because people haven't actually read it or seen it people think it's an autobiography but it is absolutely not an autobiography very rarely does she talk about herself or her family in that book but it's a hugely critical polemic that dismantles the political economy of the film industry so she tells you what is the organizational structure and she def- she uses this very marxist language to talk about film as a capitalist project that extracts and exploits its workers and most interestingly she includes stars and actresses also as workers so for her she is not in sh- anyone that's doing this kind of physical and psychic work labor and is being extracted and exploited by those that go work away with the profits all of those people for her are sinner workers so it became very useful for me to work with that and then to think of the hunger strike as her way of showing what is the bodily work um and how to how she has control of her own body she should be the one who decides if the body depletes and exhausts right or that it is recharged and recuperated she's trying to show that it's not the the producers that own her labor time and her labor power so it was it's through many um, kinds of traces small clues fragments that i had to stitch together many of these stories and it was especially hard for those that are not stars not actresses like the case of um nalini a background dancer that i talk about later in the book ah, okay <clears throat> no um i think uh, just one quick question for me before we get the questions from the uh, audience there are three or four uh, and i'd like you like to kind of come to the end of the way that you kind of end the book which is really looking at the bodies of the struggler and the fan and thinking about thinking about them as an essential part of the cine ecology uh, no thank you that's a chapter very dear to my heart and uh, i feel like it's i ended up writing so many words that very few people get to the end of the book but i always hold it out as a carrot that chapter 6 begins with sharuk khan people <laughs> i'm a big fan and um, i've tried to also uh, keep like bringing in my own embodied experience of film the love of film the exhaustion from film in different ways in the book so in chapter 6 i begin with an in with an incident where uh, i was waiting outside a kind of preview theater uh, when we were doing special previews for omkara and i felt a tap on my shoulder and i turned around and it was sharuk khan who was shooting for dawn at that time and happened to be nearby and then said i want to come and watch this film and of course in that moment i froze because i was like what do i do should i get down on one knee and propose marriage and i decided to do the dumb thing which was just play cool so i just turned and <laughs> whatever nothing happened but it was useful for me to go back to that memory because um i was very interested in thinking of what is what kind of affect and desire is the desire of the fan right and part of that desire is this being seen and being recognized in the eyes of this person that you've idolized um and so i discussed then uh, manish sharma's film fan which does this so brilliantly and it was very important for me to think about this question of why do people continue to join this film industry and be a part of the cine ecology which has had so many negative narratives about it from its very inception so even today if you think about the huge vilification of bollywood that's ongoing for the last 2 years right why would why would anyone even want to be a part of this thing 
right? Which has got so much public opinion against it. Even when I wanted to join, uh, go to Bombay, my own relatives would caution my mother and say, it's a very bad place. And are you sure? Like she, <laughs> you know. Um, so one of the things I wanted to think about is that people that choose to ally themselves with this cultural imaginative form, which is known to be exploitative, known to be dangerous, known to be precarious, what are some of their motivations? And of course, there are motivations of money and so on. But there is also that desire of the fan that is also at the back of a lot of that interest. So a lot of people uh, who join films, they join for the love of film. Um, and that love of film could be fandom for a direct star to want to be close to a star, even if you're a spot boy or a light boy on the set, but you're working on the same set as Shah Rukh Khan, right? Um, there is that desire and I wanted to give it some good amount of attention and presence, right? Because it's very easy in, in, in histories of film industry from an academic point of view to only think of it as a place of gloom and doom, of victimization, uh, of exploitation. But there's also huge amounts of love and desire here. And the fan was able to help me make that connection between the image, right? as that place where the desire is first produced and the place of production, the set, right? Um, so how to then connect up histories of viewing and with histories of making. And the fan helps mm. me connect the dots through that yeah. relay of, of desire. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Devishri. I'm going to kind of go to the questions that we have. We have, I think, three. Um, that I can read out. Maybe I'll start off with uh, the question from Sankita. Uh, while you were researching for your book, did you come across narratives of Bombay cinema's relationship with film industries, with other film industries during the time? The technicians working across industries as they do today. The narratives work across industries. With, uh other film industries yeah no so yes yeah, so th that's that's been a very very important uh thing for me and that was also then emerging from the material and which is why i also needed a framework that was not uh, the usual ways of thinking uh a film um production is as industry and over and over i was finding that it was becoming a bit limiting for me because when you think of bombay film industry you, there are a lot of assumptions that it's located in one place, that there are a few studio buildings which comprise the industry. And there was a lot outside of it that was also actually part of this, and uh, which wasn't, uh, and I needed a framework like semi ecology to be able to speak to that. And part of that was these connections with other cities, other film industries, other parts of the subcontinent. So there was a huge amount of traffic um, between, say, Calcutta, Lahore, uh, Madras, Bombay, Pune, Kolhapur, as different people were trying to figure out, uh, getting interested first in, in thinking of film as work, as cinema as their possible vocation, and were trying out different permutations. So someone who started working in Calcutta in the 20s Right, decided, okay, actually Bombay is the next big thing that's happening right now. I'm going to move there. Someone that's working in, in Bombay at a particular point decides that, oh, actually Lahore is making more interesting musical films. So I want to go and position myself as a singer over there. And there's also a lot of sharing and collaboration in terms of technicians. Equipment is also moving. Uh, and there's a lot of dialogue across these uh, different film production centers. Um, finance is coming from a particular place. Bombay is producing films in multiple languages, right? At a particular point, Bombay studios are making films in Tamil, uh, Marathi, Gujarati. Uh, Calcutta is making films in Hindi, Urdu, and Bengali at the same time, also Tamil at a particular point. So a, a huge part of the story is the movement of people and uh, tracking the movement of people and things becomes a part of the very important method for me in the book. So not to think about things as static, but as mobile. And what starts to emerge when you track itineraries, right, of people who are like Jaddan Bai, who moves uh, from uh, Lahore 
to Calcutta, to Bombay, and so on. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Bhavishri. A uh, question from Julie Francis. <clears throat> Your book shows that the Bombay film industry had a social and a cultural fluidity. This changed after independence. How would you read the current moment where we live in a post-globalized world? Okay, so I don't know if we live in a post-globalized world. Um, I think the interesting thing for me is how this idea of a globalized world is not new and that it continually shifts in its tendencies. So the moment I'm looking at is also in many ways a globalized world. I just don't want that baggage of globalization for it. But it's a, it's a time of a huge amount of transnational traffic of people, but also of ideas and also of films, right? So part of the, the enabling structures, uh, ironically, of that traffic is colonialism. So Bombay is firmly a part of a transnational um, economy and a trade circuit because it's a very important hub for the British colonial uh, economy. That connects Bombay with Melbourne or Sydney or with uh, Singapore or with various other points of that uh, colonial map, which is a map that's fundamentally premised on uh, the circulation of commodities and goods. But it's that same uh, network that also then allows film to travel to all of these places as another commodity and a good. Right, which is how cinema in 1896 simultaneously pretty much right shows up in Bombay, in Sydney, in New York, and in Paris. So if we think about the Lumiere brothers for screenings, right? It's it's not there was hardly any kind of time gap between when the first cinematograph was shown in Paris and when it was first shown in Bombay, because these are very important colonial port cities. But there is something very specific to Bombay in the subcontinental schema that makes it a much more vibrant and cosmopolitan place. And so I've tried to tell that story, not hopefully only as a romantic, nostalgic story that is something very uh, unique about Bombay, but try to understand again, what was it that made it that place? So part of it is that it's, on the, it's in, along the Western Indian Ocean. It is a port city. There's a lot of changes that are taking place there. A lot of uh, important uh, nationalist leaders are headquartered in Bombay city, not in Delhi, not in Calcutta. Um, cotton is become such a huge industry um, starting from the Bombay region that it takes, it really kind of um, skyrockets Bombay into a national place of significance. It becomes a financial capital. Um, the strikes that take place in that textile industry in Bombay are so huge, right? And so debilitating that they become a matter for national debate. And this is pre-nation, right? An entire kind of region is interested in what's happening to mill workers in Bombay. Uh, it's also a city for various reasons. Um, I think also because of a huge Anglo-Indian population, huge histories of various kinds of uh, Jewish migration, different kinds of uh, Muslim communities, right? And a huge, basically a migrant city. A lot of people coming in from the Konkan region, Gujarat and so on, uh, that also allows for a different kind of a texture for women's public presence. So some of the first women that take up white collar work in the city, you start to see that in Bombay. So there's, and of course, then the local train, um, uh, the coming of electricity. There are many other infrastructural things that are also happening that allow Bombay to kind of inhabit this place of a lot of social mixing and possibility of mobility. And for me, a huge part of that story is important for why cinema becomes such a big thing in Bombay. Today, I think Bombay <laughs> is still very much all of those things, right? Uh, but of course, there are many pressures on the city and on cinema that is produced in the city, as we all know, uh, which are not just tragic, they are obviously hugely troubling, but th there are many kinds of films, I think, still being made in, in Mumbai 
uh, that still give us some hope. Um, but yeah, there things things are quite different today. <clears throat> A question from Mustafa Qureshi. Uh, your book is about the different practices of cinema. You also started as a practitioner. Are you tempted to go back, going back to being a film practitioner along with being an academic? I don't know. I don't feel tempted. Uh, it was a very particular kind of work. I think it was just such a formative experience for me in my 20s to be doing that. I do miss the experience of being on set often, right? Just being part of that whole heady kind of um, chaos, right? Of lights and wires and people. And But I also realized, I think, while I was doing that work, that I'm, I basically, I, I like doing solitary work. <laughs> This is uh, such, and because it's such collaborative work, right? And I, I also know that the, the kind of films that I wanted to be associated with were feature fiction feature films. Uh, and that would entail a large numbers of people uh, to work with. And it wasn't something that I was able to sustain beyond a point. I, um, I very much applaud all my friends and colleagues from those years, right, that have continued with that struggle in that sense. But I also felt that it became very important for me while I was working in film at the time to try and make sense of where this form comes from. And I really wanted to think about who are the predecessors to myself in the 2000s, right? That made it possible for me to do that work as a young AD in Bombay. So for me, his history, the history of cinema is, is I think, a very vital work that I'm very still committed to. And I I ex hope that it, it it can be a very inspiring thing for people that are practitioners today um, in Bombay to make sense of their own history. Thanks, Devishri. Um, the, those are the last of the questions for now. And I think we are actually over the time that was allotted. Uh, so I'm going to kind of uh, be going to end with a comment actually that's come in the comment box. It says that this is not a question from SN. Uh, just to say that I've ordered the book while listening to this talk and can't wait to read it. And you know, I have to recommend the book to everyone who's listening. Um, it's a fabulous book. Um, lots of great stories. Maybe she's just told us literally just the tip of the iceberg of the of the kind of research that's been uh, that's that's there within the book. An extraordinary exhibition, I believe, in 1939, um, held in Bombay uh, to promote the film industry, being one of those which I, you know, had very little knowledge of, and I saw photographs of that exhibition in your book. So it's really and just behind Gate Station. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's incredible. There's a lot of very in interesting material in there. So I highly recommend it to everybody uh, to read the book. Uh, and thanks, Devishri, for this uh, for this talk. Um, I'm going to get uh, Subhashri in. Uh, Subhashri? Thank you everyone um, for being here and thanks so much Rohan for reading the book with such care and love and uh, yeah and over to Subhashri. Thank you Devashri and thank you and uh, I thought it was a really lovely way the comment to end the discussion because um, if through this one hour, uh, you know, there have been people who've joined this conversation and want to know more about the book and read it, I would think that that's fantastic because that's in some ways why we, what we do at Urban Lens is to create a conversation on films and now books. And what is it at the end of the day? We all love cinema in different ways and forms and it's an invitation to that. So it's been a real pleasure to listening to you both and Debushri, I look forward to your next piece of work. I mean, you're shifting and you, your work is very different from what you've done. So we're all very excited about it. And inshallah, I hope we can, you can be part of Urban Lens with your next book when it comes out. So all the very best for it. And thanks, Rohan. Yes. <laughs> And uh, thank you all for, to all our viewers and those who asked the questions. And, and we hope to see you tomorrow. Um, we have two panels. Tomorrow is the closing day of, uh, of the festival. So if you haven't watched the films as yet, please do go watch. It's there for 24 more hours. Um, we have around 27 films playing currently as I speak. Um, the, we, the, the last two panel discussions are, are tomorrow. So at 5 p.m., uh, filmmaker, animator Nina Sabnani will be in conversation with Paramita Vora about her body of work and what constitutes her film practice and what she creates. At 7 p.m., there's a panel discussion 
called uh, Future of Cinema, no less, which has uh, Bina Paul, Radha Sesic, and Daniel Mattis, who will be in conversation with filmmaker uh, Shabani Hasanwalia. So the, the, the first one is at 5 p.m. IST, and the second one is at 7 p.m. IST. So look forward to seeing you all there. And thanks once again, Debushree and Rohan, and good night to all of you. Bye-bye.